Okay, welcome everybody, welcome to the panelists. I, before I start with the first question, I'd like to give you the opportunity to briefly introduce yourself. And because we want to talk about open source in this panel, I'd like you to limit your introduction to just three words. Ines. Yeah. Okay, um, founder, programmer, and maker. All right, um, engineer, event, bro event broker, and 5.9. Andreas? Um, scientists and machine learning. <laughs> That's already two, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would say founder and engineer and human. Okay, thank you. In the first part of the panel, I would like to focus on why we are using open source, and in the second half, how to do open source right. And my first question to the four of you is, why did you decide to go open source in your project? Maybe one statement from each of you. Let's, let's start on the left side with Lionel. Okay, so the, the project started before I joined the company, but I asked and there were three reasons. First one, because we were doing it anyway, we try to have open source infrastructure projects to be open source. Second one for better code quality and uh, code that's more modernized and uh, more configurable. And the third one is we want to talk to other people doing the same thing we do so we can learn from them, make sure we don't do anything stupid. Yeah. Um, well, so for us, it all pretty much came down to that question of like, why should people even care about that shit that we're doing? And the best, especially because we're in the developer tools market and often people will only know that something works for them after they use it. So for us, that's a really big point. We can actually get people to use our software, see that what we're doing makes sense for them, that we can solve their problems and um, yeah, get started that way, which is why Spacey, for example, is um, an open source library. So we, we started about three years ago in Berlin coming out of, of a university research team and now our project is being used at Uber, at Netflix, at Alibaba, at a huge scale. I don't think that if this was something closed source they would open the door to a small team uh, from Berlin. So I was always using like open source since I started programming and I thought, wow, this is so cool that I can just like have all this software and do these amazing things uh, for free basically. And so for me, it was, for us, it was mostly a decision um, to give back something to the community. Um, and we also thought it would make sense economically. But I think the first reason was really um, the, the will to just give something back and to have something where you can say, hey, we built that and a lot of people are using that. I think that was the strongest motivation. But a question that I get quite frequently is, uh, how can you actually make money out of this? I mean, if you are essentially throwing out the crown jewels out of your company, then what do you live off? Well, I think that this is all based on this misconception that like first, um, your code is something valuable that you need to lock up. And that's often actually um, not the case. And um, also that's why I personally believe that uh, monetizing your open source project directly is a really, really bad business strategy, and I think I have some more ideas on this, but should I? Yeah, um, yeah but so for example, for us, it's, well, we do publish open source software, but this gives us this connection to our users, and it also builds trust. And so we can say, hey, okay, you, our software is clearly solving a problem for you. So this means, you know, we can offer you other things that probably will also solve problem, and that you can plug in to the workflow you're already using with our software, and that's how, in our case, we make money, not by actually monetizing the software itself. So I think it's a very good question, and it's, it's challenging. So I think it is a challenge. It's not easy, yeah? But there are several ways. So for example, what we are doing is what is called an open core model, where you have the core of the system open source, and then a bunch of tools that you need around that to make it you know, very easy to use, very easy to use in the enterprise, uh, closed source. Uh, other things that we are doing is offer, offer something as a service, right? If, if, if it's just software as a service, then you don't care if it's open source underneath or not. Uh, but it's definitely challenging. It's not, uh, and, and I think we're gonna see during the next years a lot more of ways to monetize on open source. But I think the question is really the opposite. How do you monetize closed source nowadays? That's equally hard, yeah? Getting there, getting the adoption, getting the user base, that's, it's much, much harder. Open, open source. 
I mean, to answer the question, open sure. source is how you would monetize closed source. And I think, I mean, yeah, your example is probably very similar to ours, and yeah. it's a very good example of how this can work. So yeah, for us, the main motivation was not to make money with the open source version, but as you say, um, have other things around that that would add value to the product and then charge for that. Because people are, like open source contributors, they're passionate about writing like interesting software like uh, for machine learning or um, data analysis, but there are not many programmers that are passionate about writing LDAP integrations or like an accounting system. And these components you can sell as, an op as a closed source uh, part of the open source system to make it easier to use for companies. So I think this open core model is really something that is uh, can be very successful. And I mean, they have a lot of there are a lot of companies that uh, successfully pulled this off um, in Germany and uh, worldwide. And I think that the, I have seen a bunch of open source projects fail if they don't have a driving force behind them. So actually, having a vendor, a company behind the open source project that makes money with it is a good thing yeah. for the open source project. That's who develops it. But I think the biggest, yeah, the biggest problem I've seen in this space is definitely this idea of oh, selling consulting and selling help on top of it. Because in the end, you always end up in this very weird situation, with very misaligned incentives where, okay, the more popular your software gets, the more people want to have your services, but you also want to provide more help to your users. But so you end up thinking about, oh, should, should I improve my docs? If I improve my documentation, less people will pay me to help them with my software. But if I don't, then less people will start using my software. So I think this is, I would say this is the number one mistake that people can make and that's not gonna work out. So maybe there's other benefits that open, going open source has uh, that are not related to money. Um, Lionel, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, thank you. So for Zalando, we have other, um, the other benefits to, to using open source. And the first one is Zalando is a tech company um, and we want people to know that Zalando is a tech company just like Apple, uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, something like that. That's one of them. Another one is a, it's an excellent recruitment tool. Uh, I remember when I was hired, one of the first things the uh, recruiter told me is, like, hey, check out our GitHub page, because uh, it's really cool. So that works. And then, um, yeah, there's uh, also you get contributions from, from outside, so the bugs that other people find are bugs I don't have to find. Um, the features that they write are features I don't have to write and I can focus on other things. You yeah, think uh, the community building aspect is really something uh, that is very, that is worth a lot uh, for us. Um, for Quantified Code, we had several smaller open source projects, for example, a documentation um, or the, like a, a book, if you want, uh, that a lot of people contributed to. And this really helped us to grow our community and find like enthusiastic users that would like try to test our uh, product and give us valuable feedback. So in the end, this was, I would say, even more valuable than um, like the contributions themselves because it, for a startup, it's a, m a marketing channel that is much cheaper, if you want, more effective than uh, having paid advertisement or something like that. So having a good community behind your project also gives you a lot of information and a lot of valuable feedback. So I think that's, besides people using the product, of course, one of the biggest advantages. Yeah, I totally agree. So it, it creates a network effect. People from the community come together they exchange ideas with each other without even the creators being involved, right? So it's important also to, you know, give room, like conferences like this, to these kind of communities to physically get together. Um, and totally agree with the hiring. We hired an engineer in Taiwan uh, because he was working on the open source project that we created. It was the easiest interview that we did ever. Yeah, so it was the smoothest experience in both sides. So I'd like to take the point that Lionel mentioned so uh, you said that going open source is an excellent recruiting tool. Um, does it cut both ways? So if I, uh, if I hire at Zalando, uh, then I can have in the back of my mind um, that if I leave the company at some later point, then um, my contribution would still be visible on GitHub. Or is this something that, that recruits have, that you have talked about with people working there? Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I can't tell that everyone at Zalando does open source. I'm going to talk about the team I'm in specifically. We do a uh, event broker and it, it is open source. Um, but yes, we f not only do we know that uh, whatever we do at Zalando might still be useful if we leave, uh, it also keeps us uh, honest and focused and um, keeps our work of high quality because we don't want to, we don't want everybody to see bad code. So, you know, we were careful of having uh, writing good code. 
So um, another value, of course, of going open source is that it has brought you to this panel. Yeah. Another thing, um, we heard in the morning that there was a panel discussion downstairs on the new privacy laws. Uh, do you see a role for uh, open source when considering issues like privacy or data protection? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, honestly, um, I think most companies, even those that offer commercial services around like data protection, privacy, etc., um, they run their infrastructure on probably, I guess, 90%, 95% open source software. And a lot of the packages, for example, for data anonymization, um, pseudonymization, um, uh, encryption, etc., are basically open source software. And today, I think it would be crazy as a company to say we are just rewriting everything ourselves, you know? So I think it's a very important part, uh, and uh, most things couldn't be done without open source software today. Um, I don't see anything else in open source software that allows you to easily audit the code and actually make sure that the data gets to where you think it goes. And also you can run it yourself as opposed to on someone else's computer. So you get more control over that. In terms of the project we work on specifically, we also, because it's an event broker, we get terabytes of data going through every day. And um, with regard to the GDPR laws and, and uh, data protection, we build in um, strong uh, authentication authorization to make sure that people can sort of choose who gets to access what and uh, things. Um, have, have there been times where you would have wished to make your project private again? Yeah, maybe when there are 500 open pull requests. <laughs> no, actually. Uh? Work a lot, <laughs> yeah. Just just work through the night, yeah. It's yeah, but it's it's no. I think never. I've never I've never hoped that this was private, honestly. Yeah. I, I hope I'm not hogging the microphone for too long, but uh, I don't want Nakadi to the, the project I'm working on to to be private again. But uh, working on an open source project is quite a responsibility, and it, it involves quite a lot of work. We could. If we were doing things privately, there's probably a bunch of things we would not have to do. So there is a commitment in terms of time, in terms of getting people on board, uh, the entire team from engineers to product people to um, coaches and, uh, and uh, management. Uh, you have to reply to pull requests. We have, um, Zalando has guidelines about how maintainers of open source projects should behave when they maintain open source projects. And some of these things are replying to a pull request ideally within 24 hours. Having at least two maintainers so nobody burns out. And if you're on holiday, someone still can handle emergencies. Having good documentation, tests, security audits all the time. So I wouldn't stop, but it, it's work and you have to consider it when you stop. Yeah, I think that's a... I think that's a really important point because it's, it requires a big effort to, do, to build a uh, successful open source project and people have um, high demands sometimes on that. Um, I mean, I had like uh, cases where at like three uh, at, in the night I get some email from uh, like someone in China who's complaining loudly about like, uh, oh, your project is not working and there's this bug and this bug and then expecting us or me to fix that in a, in a couple of hours. So. Um, I think this really changed uh, because there are so many successful and good open source projects out there, so people have like, um, like strong demands and they really expect you to, to fix their bugs as fast as possible and provide like enterprise-like service. And um, as a company, I think you have to really um, be conscious about the, as that decision that you take because it really takes a lot of effort. And if you want the project to be successful, um, you will have to... Uh, invest a lot of hours and uh, have a few people at least dedicated to the project, I think. And I mean, this is really a serious investment, so to say. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree um, with that point. And also, I think a big problem is that a lot of people still have this very um, traditional community open source um, style in mind, where, okay, some people get together, build something together, and sure, that's still how it works. But if you Moving on to a commercial level, it's very different. And also, I believe, because with our software, we are telling people actively, hey, our software is great, we've put a lot of work into it, your company should use that in production. And I, that, in my opinion, that puts, or we believe that this puts us in a position where we have to deal, we have to fix stuff. If something's broken, we have to fix it. People are giving us a lot of trust up front, and um, we've decided to build our library in a certain way. We only have two core contributors. Um, it's very concise, but that also means that we're in charge 
of um, keeping it all together. And we can't just um, adopt this community or private open source mentality of like, oh, pull request or get the fuck out. Like that's, that does not work if you're doing it on a commercial level. So, so Ines, could you explain a bit what you mean by this, the difference between community open source and company open source? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think in general they're like, they're pretty much, um, I think three models. One is personal open source. You build something, you think, hey, maybe that's useful to others as well. So you put it online. Maybe you think you want to get hired at Zalando or somewhere else, so you want to showcase your work. Then you have community open source, where just people get together, say, let's build something together, and let's work on this. You have a very flat hierarchy, um, and um, everyone's sort of in charge. But also the, the expectations of the user are a bit higher. Like, the user has to figure out how to run it. The maintainers are not in charge. And then you have the company side, where it's more on a level of, hey, we build a product, and we're giving it to you for free. So the user has a lot less um, responsibility. It's more on the company, but on the other hand, you also often have a much higher quality of product. So okay. that's how I see the ecosystem. How, how do you guys see that? So in, in our case, what we do is that the open source project is part of the Apache Software Foundation. So it's, def so it's a community project, right? So there's a, a non-profit organization that dictates who is a committer, it's called, or a maintainer, who is not. There is a democratic procedure for voting these members in. There's a, prog a project management committee, et cetera. And a very core part of this foundation is that companies cannot be part of it, right? So the, so, so, so the company that I founded, right, even though you know, we employ most of the committers, we don't have some kind of formal relationship. We cannot say anything as a company. It really comes from the people. Um, and the cool thing about it is that, you know, that really empowers the developers, the engineers. It's really developer-driven. Then and then my job is to retain the developers, to, to make them happy to work at my company rather than go uh, somewhere else where they would keep their committer rights, right? So this has worked, you know, quite successfully in a few projects, uh, Hadoop being the largest one, uh, with, with many vendors involved in the project, like Cloudera, Hornworks, and others. So it's, it's a viable model. It's, it's one of the you know, models that seems viable right now. Um, we have some sort of a hybrid um, uh, company model. So we, we are a team of, uh, I think, 10 people total, including managers and product people, so actually five engineers, uh, working on Nakadi, which is a big project. And a lot of people inside Zalando use it. And so we have our roadmap, uh, but there's only so much we can do with five people. So we do get external contributions, either from within Zalando, from people who work at work, or even in their free time, or from, from outside. And we've had contributions to Nakadi itself, like bug fixes and like small features. But more importantly, we actually saw an ecosystem of free software develop around it. So people have been writing client libraries and sharing them with other teams, uh, other, other users, and helpers, and a bunch of things. Um, so we've got our own roadmap. If you want to add features to Nakadi, we'll very much welcome that. If the feature is very big, probably we need to talk a bit in advance. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think just just to add to this, like you raise a really good point, which is the third-party ecosystem, because we've also seen from our experience that encouraging other users to build extensions for a library that they use and like is often much more productive to get them started than asking them to read the whole code base and contribute to the core. So um, yeah, that's kind of how we've started to handle this. And it seems to be working very well, because we don't have to deal with this weird dynamic of people trying to contribute. But at the same time, they are two maintainers who eventually will decide what's going to happen. And um, yeah, I think that's a very viable way to work around that. Yeah, I mean, um, from my um, experience, not only with our own open source project, but also with other projects in general, you can say that you have like kind of a power law distribution in terms of contributors. So like 10% of the people usually contribute like 90% of the code. And then there are a lot of people that contribute a little bit of code and a lot of people that just maybe um, contribute like a small fix from time to time or even like um, things like changing typos and stuff. And that's also super valuable, but um, you have to kind of like plan around the fact that um, most of the maintenance work and most of the knowledge about your project will reside in a small group of people and then there will be a large periphery around that of uh, people that contribute sometimes, but they don't have like a, um, a bird's eye view of the project, so to say. 
And I mean, I think that's just the nature of um, most uh, organically grown organizations or projects like that. And that's also something that you have to take into account when working on these kind of things. Yeah. We are now already in the middle of discussing how to run an open source project. And uh, Ines, you mentioned uh, that engaging the community is, uh, or helping people to get started uh, is quite important for you. Could you give examples, what are the things uh, that somebody who is using the software uh, would help that person to get more into the, even if it's a minor contributor role? Well, I think it definitely comes down to the documentation and also the assumptions you make about your users. I think it's false to think that, oh, AI, it's all a very, like, people have very similar backgrounds. They're all computer scientists. They all move like that. Like, that's not true. Like, our community has linguists who are just getting into, like, natural language processing. We have maybe front-end developers who are starting to get into machine learning. So you can't make any basic assumptions on, okay, what do people already know? So we found um, that we say, okay, we start... At a very simple point, we have um, written a lot of documentation and guides that really explain how we're doing things, um, how things work in simple terms without setting like um, extensive rules that sound like, oh, if you break them, you're going to be scrutinized. And, and I think in general, the bottom line is just don't be a dick to people. Like I've never understood, like even from an economic point of view, purely economic point of view, it's not more effective to be um, a dick to people uh, than it is to be nice to people. And it's, it's, it's a very, it sounds very basic, but I've seen that this is a concept that, especially still in open source, some people seem to struggle with. And um, I think if you just engage with your people and you're just a decent fucking person, then I think that already gets you a huge like, amount of steps forward than it otherwise would. So I think in the beginning, it's very important to have yeah, good documentation, as, as good as possible. You know, documentation is never going to be really good. Um, have an open backlog of tasks on Jira for the community. Uh, label them as you know, easy, medium, hard, so that a new contributor, maybe a student, you know, whoever can just pick an easy task and get started. I think later on, as an open source project grows, people are going to come and then it is, the goal is less to attract more and more people, but more to maintain the quality. So then it sort of changes. People are really want, want to contribute, so they're going to do the hard work. By that time, probably the documentation is going to be better anyways, right? But I think in the beginning, it's very important to have an open backlog. So not just the code, but also, you know, guidelines, how to contribute, uh, open, you know, open list of issues, be very responsive, be very clear on what is an acceptable contribution and what not. Uh, open guidelines. Yeah, yeah um, I agree, and we have uh, these things on the on GitHub for Nakadi. Um, another two things we find are quite helpful is first because we have an infrastructure project. You deploy Nakadi, you deploy Zookeeper, and you deploy Kafka, and then you deploy Nakadi. You can do it locally in one command, and that's really important that people can get started right away. They start it up, and then they can send and receive messages immediately. Um, so that's one thing. The other, we've got these uh, issues that are labeled with help wanted. So if you want to help, you know what to do. And we're nice people also. Um, but, but most importantly, we reply very quickly to issues. Like someone raises an issue, we really make an effort to reply within a day. And that gives um, the, the message that anyone who takes the time to even just open an issue and complain about a bug this is very important to us, and we, we really appreciate that you take at least the time to, to look at it. Um, yeah, something, I just want to add one thing, because something that I found really great is um, also, and important, is meeting people in person. And I mean, there are a lot of conferences uh, for each language, or sometimes even a framework, um, where you can meet groups of people to sprint together on something. For example, in our community, the Python, um, community, there's the PyCon, and there's always like, after the conference, I think three or four days of uh, so-called sprints, where just people um, come together to work on a project, you know, you can go there as a beginner, or even if you know the people already, and you can just like work really focused um, for like three or four days, and that's really something very valuable, because you can interact with the people, you can like uh, um, meet them face to face, uh, form a community in real life, so to say, and just get a lot of work done in a very short amount of time, and 
this, um, I mean, we didn't use that enough, I think, for our project, but I think it can be a really, really great uh, thing uh, to do like once or twice a year or even more. Sorry, I have one more thing that really helps is uh, we have automated tests, we have uh, CI builds, and we have uh, clear guidelines in terms of what we expect, in terms of code style. We want all tests to pass. So when you open a pull request, it'll be built automatically, and you'll get a report right away. And if everything is green, there's a really high chance that we'll be very happy with your pull request. So you already know right away that, that you've passed the first hurdle, and then we're also more confident that your code is good quality. Okay, now these are all valuable points. Um, now, if, you're, if you, I'm a company that is considering uh, releasing one project as open source, I may be a bit afraid because this is, once I have done this, it's very difficult to, um, to turn back, at least in my uh, personal view. Do you have any advice for me, uh, or for, for us essentially, how to get started? What are the first steps? Could you launch a project even if it's just in a test balloon stage? Or should there be some minimal threshold that is achieved? Okay, so uh, Zalando has guidelines about that, so that, that's pretty clear. Uh, if you want to start an open source project, um, you have to make a case for it. You have to have code that's of a certain quality, you've got to have security audits, you've got to have a bunch of things. Once you get the okay to start your open source project, you've got at least two maintainers, so we know that you're going to last for at least a little bit. You go into an incubator. An incubator is sort of, sort of a purgatory phase of six months where your project's open, it could be pulled back. So we watch and see how the project goes. Are people interested? Because if no one's interested, there's really no point. Um, and if things go well, people are interested, you respond quickly, then it gets promoted to a proper open source project. But I would think not just writing good code, but also building a community and doing outreach and promotion for your project is very important for a successful one. Yeah, I think that's a really good model. Actually, the Apache has the same model. It has an incubator first for new projects where you have to sort of prove that you can build a community. That's the number one thing. Because otherwise, it's just some code on GitHub, right? That's, you know, that's not in your benefit. Well, I mean, you know, it's fine, right? But it's not an open source project. An open source project is a lively community. So I think that's sort of the, the benchmark here exactly. Uh, can you build a community around it? Yeah. And also I think, um, yeah, once you make that step, your stuff should actually, should already work and be decent. Like I think I'm gonna say something that's probably very contrary to the whole like, oh, launch early startup narrative, but um, I don't actually believe that this is a viable model for a lot of software. There's, so much software out there and there's also a lot of bad code out there. Nobody, you know, if you can't make a case why anyone would want your kind of half assed library, yeah, you can publish it, but especially from a commercial perspective as a company, you should probably not waste your time on this because it's likely nobody needs, nobody needs this. But if you can make that case. Um, I, I think I should delete half of my GitHub repositories. <laughs> uh, yeah. Robert, are, you, are you a company that's like telling people um, they should use your libraries in production? No, essentially not. Yeah. So then <laughs> I think I would say that's perfectly fine and reasonable. So, <laughs> yeah. so what I would like to add is that, um, I mean, of course, um, if your goal is to build like a really large and successful project, um, I think it's good to have this guideline, but I think it's also good to remember that even if only a small number of people uses your project, so if you just put it on GitHub and you say, okay, whoever um, might have that problem can use it, that's already valuable. So you know, even um, as a company, um, you can think about like publishing really small tools. And one company I'm working for, like the DCSO, a German cybersecurity organization, where we have like smaller, several small GitHub projects uh, around like the tooling that we built um, in IT security. And these tools, they're like maybe a few hundred lines long and uh, we don't build like a commu an active community around them, but we still see that uh, people download them, use them, and that they provide value. And I think um, if you want to start small, um, you can also like start by just like pushing like a really small project and then um, not having a, a huge effort of building a community around it, but still generate some uh, good value for a lot of people out there. We are moving towards the, uh, the end. I have two tough questions uh, served up for this. 
uh, this time of the panel. Number one is, now this is all nice and nice and fine, but now imagine you are doing some serious stuff with, um, with software. So let's say you are building aeroplanes uh, or aeroplane uh, software or uh, running a hospital or a nuclear power plant or whatever, where things should, must not go wrong. Um, do you have any experience how to reach the reliability that is required in these so-called high integrity environments? Um, I mean, of course, it depends on what open software, uh, open source software you're providing. Like, are you providing software for banks? Probably not. You're providing underlying developer tools, and of course, you should uh, stick to a certain standard. But I think it's also important to get across especially in the developer tools field to companies that you still need to apply common sense on top of everything you do. Like, you know, in, the, in that talk before us, I think Tristan mentioned Stack Overflow. And sure, that's a great platform. But um, yeah, if you just copy, if you just stitch together things from Stack Overflow and open source libraries, um, this can easily lead to a framework that doesn't actually hold up to any requirements you have for production. So. Um, yeah, just because something is free and available doesn't mean you can just like run it and forget about it. Other short comments. So uh, for, for our last startup, we looked a lot at um, code quality um, and I read a lot of like academic publications that try to answer the question um, that by comparing like closed source to open source projects. And what these papers, these uh, studies usually find is that on average, the quality of the open source projects is usually much higher than the quality of the closed source ones. So if you are a company doing security relevant stuff, I think you should ask a question, can you really afford to run everything on closed source software or should, would it maybe be better to actually use open source? Because on average, um, the level of quality and the level of security that you can get is higher. Of course there are, if you have like a specialized vendor that like promises you like a certain um, quality level and that can also ensure that, um, then maybe it might be better. But in general, I think open source software really doesn't need to hire um, against like closed source when it comes to quality or security or anything else? If it's open source, you can audit it or have someone do yeah. it for you. Um, you, can, you can also contribute if you find any issues. Uh, and just like with uh, closed source software, you can, you can look around like who else in your field is using uh, Nakadi, uh, what we do, and it's highly available. Um, what, what are other people doing? Um, and with open source software, you can just make sure that you can, you can go talk to people, you can look at the code by yourself and satisfy yourself that it actually fulfills a requirement. You shouldn't just take something because it's open source. Like, it's open source, now I can look into it more carefully than if it wasn't. So we see a lot of these use cases. We see we have you know, banking use cases, use cases with planes that you mentioned and so on. So at the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, open source software is created by people. And closed source software is created by people. So it's really about the quality of people that write the software. There is no reason to regard open source software as less secure or less whatever than closed source. It's, it's you know, if anything, it's the opposite, right? So it's really about rigorous testing and, you know, very good software development and hiring the best people. Okay. For the... Um so for the last question before we do final remarks, just please answer in one sentence. I don't want to go deep into law, but when you think about open source licenses, what is there that could go terribly wrong that we definitely should avoid? One sentence, please, everyone. If you don't read the license, you might have uh, surprises. <laughs> okay. um... Actually, as a project, choosing a license that's not permissive enough and that's trying to monetize uh, things on certain levels instead of just going, just giving people rights to all rights uh, to your software, which is often more. Uh, that, was, that was a sentence. <laughs> I think if you want to get that right and you're not a lawyer, um, you should definitely get one because most of the licenses, they haven't been designed with, designed with like uh, commercial use in mind, so um, often they're not really adequate. So it's really important to think hard about what you want to achieve and then try with professional help to find a license that is suitable for that. And also doing a very thorough audit on your dependencies in order to be able that you can actually have the license that you want to have. Good point, yeah. Okay. So, I'd like to invite you to 
a round of final remarks. Um, so what's, in your opinion, the state of open source and what should we be more attentive to in 2018? Okay, um, the state of open source, I think open source has been around for a while and um, everyone's very happy with it, at least we are. Uh, it's very nice. What we, what we as a project uh, for, for Nakadi want to be more attentive about is really fostering uh, a community and attracting external uh, users and contributions. Uh, the code is fine, the documentation is fine, and now we, we try to get people on board. So personally, I think it's absolutely amazing what has been happening in the last five years in the open source communities. I mean, we've seen even like large companies like Microsoft really openly embracing open source. And I think that's uh, just absolutely fantastic because it makes things possible and doable, which were either prohibitively expensive a couple of years ago or not even possible for small startups or individuals. And I think, as I said, like, um, if you want to get started with open source, don't be intimidated by like, having to be a really successful project. Even small projects can provide a lot of use for people. And I think that's really that what we have to carry on. And also like the, the philosophy behind, I think, this we can like, still um, like, implant deeper in many companies by teaching them uh, to use that and embrace it instead of like, be afraid of it. I see something happening is the reconciliation of the idea of a healthy open source community giving back to the world and financially successful organizations behind it. And actually those two things working together very, very well without, without tension in the developer community. Yeah, and I think actually to add, add to this, um, we're now at a point, especially in AI, machine learning, where a lot of um, the knowledge is there, a lot of people can do very sophisticated things at home and by themselves, that we're really at a point where we shouldn't lock this knowledge away and say, okay, the only way to really show people what's possible and what you can do with the technology is to make it accessible to people, for everyone. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So thank you for your closing remarks. Thank you all four for um, being here. I'd like to ask the audience for a big applause for our panelists and see you on GitHub. <laughs>